Good morning, everyone. I want to start with a few brief updates. First, I want to let everyone know that we've recently issued updated recreational sports guidance for both indoor and outdoor youth and adult clubs and leagues, which closely mirrors our school sports guidance. Secretary Moore is on the line uh, to be able uh, to answer some of the questions that might come up and rec leads across the state should visit accd.vermont.gov for the latest guidance. Next, I'd like to also remind everyone, once again, to please take a few minutes this weekend to fill out your census forms. Getting a complete count is critical to making sure we best serve Vermonters. It impacts the amount of federal funds we receive and also many more important services. Like everything else, our ability to uh, get the responses has been hindered uh, by the pandemic, but it only takes a few minutes uh, to help and to fill these out. For anyone who doesn't have or has misplaced your form, you can complete it online at my2020census.gov. Since we're uh, heading into a holiday weekend, I want to take some time today to ask Vermonters to make an extra effort to stay smart and stay safe this weekend. We continue to lead the country in suppressing the virus. But as I said on Tuesday, that can change very quickly if we aren't smart and vigilant. So this weekend, I urge all Vermonters to have fun, celebrate the unofficial end of summer, but do so using common sense and following the health department guidance. First, get outside as much as you can this weekend. It's good for the mind and the soul. Keep six feet apart from others. Wear a mask when in public. Wash your hands a lot. If you're not feeling well, stay home and avoid large gatherings and don't travel to areas that have high case counts. It's really pretty simple when you think about it. The health department is also working to help Vermonters understand what the most risky situations are. So, I think we're showing the graphic here. Uh, gathering outside in small numbers with everyone wearing masks is the safest way to celebrate this weekend. Staying vigilant is more important than ever with our schools opening next week. Our kids need us to do our part in order to keep cases low in our communities. Our low prevalence is why it's possible for a return to in-person instruction, and we don't want to lose any ground as a result. And since this is our last press briefing before school begins on Tuesday morning, I want to talk about this a bit more as well. Mr. Pichek will present our latest data in a few minutes which continues to show the level of virus across Vermont remains low. And our public health experts continue to support our return to school. While most schools are taking a hybrid approach with three or more days of remote learning, we know there is still a lot of anxiety about returning. And I get it. But I don't want you to forget that the folks behind me and on the phone Dr. Kelso, Dr. Levine, Secretary Smith, Secretary French, Commissioner Sherling, and their incredible team of experts have been hard at work in support of our schools for months. And even more importantly, our super superintendents, principals, teachers, school nurses, custodians, and support staff across the state have stepped up to this incredible time of service to make Tuesday and all the days that follow as successful as possible for our kids. I believe in them. I have faith in them, and I thank them for their expertise and service during these unprecedented times. As we said for months, we know this isn't easy for anyone. There will be bumps in the road, maybe big ones, and there will be cases tied to schools. So I want parents and school employees to know the people on the stage and our teams behind the scenes know how important this is and we care about the health and safety of every single Vermonter. We're here to work with you as we take this big step forward. 
to respond to and contain cases and adapt to changing circumstances, just as we have throughout this entire pandemic. With that, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Kelso for a health update. Thank you, Governor. Our college restart is going well in Vermont. We've had a small number of cases, but they've been detected early, and the colleges are doing a great job of identifying those cases, getting them isolated, and ensuring that their close contacts have quarantine housing available. I also want to let you know that we've updated our data dashboard at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 to now include additional data, including county level case information, where you can see a graph of new and cumulative cases in each county, as well as breakdowns by age and sex. Before I give you an update on the Killington outbreak and other information, I want to briefly share more information about why I'm here, other than to give the cameras a break from tilting way up to film Dr. Levine, who had a conflicting appointment this morning. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm the Vermont State Epidemiologist. My team and I are responsible for infectious disease surveillance, prevention, and control for infectious diseases of public health importance. We respond to things like cases of pertussis in schools and child cares, measles exposures among travelers, foodborne disease outbreaks, HIV and sexually transmitted infections, Lyme disease, and animal bites that could be a risk for rabies. Much of what you hear from the health department is driven by the hard work and data compiled by our team of epidemiologists, public health statisticians, and microbiologists. These are the people in the trenches, along with dozens of other public health professionals from across the department who have been working ridiculous hours since this pandemic started, stepping up to investigate every cluster and outbreak and report the data, applying hard science to information and person-to-person -person supports that are getting us through this crisis. Frankly, these are my public health heroes, and I wanted you to know about them. So in Killington, a little more than a week ago, we began investigating an outbreak of cases associated with a private party at the Summit Lodge. There are currently 17 cases associated with this outbreak. Two new cases were added yesterday, and both had previously been identified as close contacts who were in quarantine. 11 of the cases attended a private party on the 19th, and six others are due to subsequent transmission from someone who is at the party. Of the 49 guests, we have reached 34. 15 of them are out-of-state residents, and we've notified their home state health departments. There might be some community spread in the coming weeks, and we understand that community members might be anxious. Multiple testing opportunities are available this week in the Rutland and Killington areas. And this is a good reminder to follow public health recommendations and make careful decisions about what we do and where we go. Wear a mask, stay six feet apart. And as the governor said, this is not the year for big cookouts and gatherings over the Labor Day weekend. We'll be continuing our investigation and we'll keep the communities and local officials informed of our progress and any actions anyone may need to take. The main point is that if you don't hear from the health department directly, that's good news. Your responsibility will be to keep taking the important precautions that stop outbreaks before they start. On Tuesday, Dr. Levine spoke about Vermont's successes in contact tracing, reaching out to confirm cases of COVID-19 and their close contacts so that people have the information and guidance they need to keep themselves healthy and importantly to prevent further spread of the virus. I'm proud of our teams and proud of Vermonters who understand the importance of answering the phone when we call and talking to us honestly and without shame so we can do our work and quickly and effectively because it's only with that support and trust that we can contain outbreaks and stop the spread that we see in other states. Our track record in contact tracing should give Vermonters confidence that we can not only maintain the gains we have achieved in keeping Vermont healthy and open, but also can move forward with opening schools.
keeping them open and our children, their teachers and staff safe. Vermont's turnaround time for lab results is one to two and a half days, unlike other states where it can take up to 10 days to get lab results. And we have 65 trained contact tracers, with more being trained just in case. We've typically needed fewer than half of the trained contact tracers at any given time. When there's a positive case, schools will communicate with staff, students, families, and their communities. But I want to make it clear that when it comes to contact tracing, it's essential that the health department's trained teams are the ones who determine potential exposures and reach out to their contacts. Contact tracing is not a notification system. A contact tracer determines the epidemiological facts, things like when a person was actually contagious, and then identifying who they have been, who they may have been within six feet of for at least 15 minutes. They ensure the person knows how to isolate or quarantine, answers questions, provide support, and protect patient privacy. So just as we tell Vermont businesses, if you're a school official and learn of a possible exposure or a case, contact the health department at 863-7240 and encourage anyone who tests positive to get in touch with us as well. All this will help ensure we can do the essential and proven work to contain this virus. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichak. Thank you, Dr. Kelso. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Pichak. I've been leading the COVID forecast and modeling team since the start of the pandemic. and. Today we'll start with a brief overview of some national data uh, before moving to Vermont data, talking about higher ed restart, K through 12 restart, uh, and then regional data and our travel map. Uh, so again, for those that are watching at home, just a reminder that our presentation can be found uh, on our website, uh, dfr.vermont.gov. Turning to the national forecast, you can see again that cases uh, are on uh, the, the downside of the peak that we experienced over the summer. However, cases still do remain uh, high, between 40,000 to 50,000 uh, new cases uh, reported uh, every single day, which is not really a good number for the country. Uh, but of course, those uh, cases are spread out throughout the country in the Northeast. We'll get into this a little bit more. Uh, we're continuing to look strong. Um, but another point, uh, and this sort of follows up on the point that the governor and Dr. Kelso made, uh, if you look at when these cases uh, really saw their explosive growth, you look two or three weeks after Memorial Day, uh, you look at the period after the 4th of July weekend, uh, and you do see cases uh, grow quite rapidly. There are many variables causing the cases to go up, but certainly, you know, the way that people behaved uh, over those weekends, not following proper uh, health guidance, certainly contributed to what the nation saw in terms of increases. So just another reminder to be safe uh, this weekend. Turning to the um, data that we have here in Vermont, like we said, Numbers are pretty consistent here. You saw that we added 52 new cases this week. Uh, Vermont continues to have the lowest um, per capita infection rate in the country from the start of the pandemic. Similarly, for the last seven days, the lowest infection rate per capita in the country and the lowest positivity rate as well. So still uh, the top on all of those uh, metrics, which is certainly what you want to see going into uh, reopening higher ed and reopening K through 12. Looking at the month that just ended, August, uh, we saw that uh, for the month of August, we uh, did a record 68,000 tests. Now this is tests, not individuals, but 68,000 tests were administered, many of those in connection with the higher ed restart, but that is the most uh, for Vermont by far. We had 214 cases for a very low positivity rate uh, for uh, the month of August. And we also had really low hospitalization for the month as well. Uh, on average, we had two people on any given day uh, in the hospital and less than a person in an ICU across the state. So those numbers uh, are very, very favorable. And then fortunately, no Vermonter passed away uh, for the month of August as well. So a lot of good news, again, leading into the restart for K through 12. Looking again at the monthly totals, you can see if you want to spend more time here that basically all of these indicators are moving in the right direction. You see that tests have increased month over month. You see that cases are really flat uh, throughout the summer, that the positivity rate has gone down uh, month over month. And similarly, the fatality rate in Vermont has been very low uh, throughout the summer. Uh, all, again, very favorable metrics pointing to 
uh, very positive signs for us here uh, in Vermont. Uh, talking about our restart metrics that we talk about every week, uh, similarly with our other numbers trending so well, that's not surprising that these four metrics continue to trend well also. Uh, we see syndromic surveillance at a very low level. These are people reporting to the emergency room or an urgent care facility with COVID-like illness. Those are well below our guardrail. Similarly, with the growth rate, we're well below our guardrail uh, on that. Very low growth and then very low positivity. We talked about how we're the, still the lowest uh, in the country. Uh, and then with so few individuals needing hospitalization for COVID in Vermont, our hospital resources continue to be quite strong also. So again, all of those restart metrics continue to trend very favorably now, three or four months into our restart, which is great to see. Turning to uh, some topics that uh, are really on people's mind, higher ed uh, and the K through 12 restart. I wanna start with the K through 12 restart. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see, again, I talked about how cases are really high in the country. And you can see by this map, uh, the last two weeks where cases have um, popped up across the entire nation. Um, and you'll see that in the Northeast, we have really low level case count, not just in Vermont, but really all across uh, the Northeast as well. And I make this point because uh, Dr. Fauci reiterated this week that the prevalence of your community is really gonna be one of the big factors in determining how safe it is to reopen your schools. Uh, you can see here in the Northeast, we have the lowest prevalence rates in the country. Uh, so that is a, a really good uh, indicator and good sign for us on the cusp of K through 12 uh, reopening. Looking now at a model that uh, we created uh, this week, working with Oliver Wyman, um, we obviously have been working with them since the start of the pandemic. They have been providing us forecasts, but we asked them to include specifically what will change in September and October with the start of K through 12. Uh, things that factor into this forecast include, you know, the communities uh, across Vermont being more mobile, uh, parents uh, being able to go back to work potentially, parents being able to run more errands and be uh, more mobile because their children are back in school, uh, and basically just the society in general uh, being more mobile. You'll see that um, the uh, purple forecast is sort of what we would expect without K through 12 reopening, and then uh, the yellow forecast is what we would expect with those factors I just mentioned included. So the forecasts uh, trend very closely to each other. Uh, they're the type of trend that does not give us concern. They're really uh, reinforcing, I think, of the message that the low prevalence that we're seeing uh, in Vermont uh, should uh, really uh, be to our benefit as we continue higher ed reopening uh, and K through 12 reopening as well. So that was really a good thing to see uh, when factoring in the K through 12 restart. Turning to higher education, uh, we talked about last week how many students are coming back to Vermont, how many ha were back to Vermont. Uh, now at this point, we can say approximately all of them, just you know, just under a few hundred are left to come back to Vermont from out of state. So basically all of the out of state college students are now back. Uh, they're being tested or have been tested. Uh, and we've gotten a considerable number of test results back. If we look at the next slide, uh, you'll see that we conducted this week uh, over 24,000 tests. Again, those are tests, not unique individuals, but 24,000 tests. So some college uh, students already got their day seven test, for example. Um, and uh, any, in any event, uh, quite a bit of testing going on on our higher ed campuses, uh, which is good to see. And then also the results are good to see as well. If we go down to the next slide, you'll see that we have conducted over 27,000 tests across higher ed in Vermont with only 33 positives to date. So a very, very low positivity rate, very, very low number of cases, considering that we have 21,000 students uh, on campus, whether living on campus or taking a class on campus. Uh, so that is a very good result. We see also in the Burlington area, similarly uh, represented here from a number of colleges in the Burlington area, uh, we did about 15, just under 16,000 tests uh, with only 13 positives, so very similar picture in the Burlington area when compared to the entire state as a whole. So again, the, 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 the re-entry part of the, K, of the uh, higher ed uh, restart is complete. The students are back on campus, uh, and now it's just a matter of making sure they follow through on the public health guidance throughout the semester. But so far, so good on the uh, higher ed restart, certainly. Turning to our regional data, we'll uh, get through this pretty quickly. Um, we did see an increase in cases this week from across the region. You'll see that we were up just under 15%. But I do want to emphasize that um, the increased testing that was going on in Vermont was going on similarly across the Northeast as college students 
came back to campus. Uh, so across our region, an increase in testing this week of about 9%. Um, so that is, partly explains why we see uh, that increase uh, across the region. But you will see we have trended up the last two weeks when we look at um, the region as a whole. But again, with college restart and K through 12 restart happening throughout the region, a lot of testing going on uh, that's not all that unexpected. And then last but not least, turning to the update on our travel map, you'll see that those cases that did creep up in the Northeast did have an impact on our map. Uh, now, you know, down from 6.6 .6 million that could come into Vermont last week, we're just uh, above 5.2 million that can come into Vermont this week, quarantine free. Of course, anyone can come to our state if they quarantine, but the green counties, the population living in green counties this week is uh, 5.2 million. And when you look at the map, you'll see some areas, you know, that are still still red in Maine, associated with that Maine outbreak with the wedding. You'll see Essex County in New Hampshire is still high. They were one of the highest counties in um, New York this past week based on population because of that outbreak at the long-term care facility. So they're uh, still dealing with that situation, but tests from that county for the last three days or four days uh, have been much lower, so that's good news, certainly. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the governor. All right, we'll open it up to questions. So I have a quick clarification on Rutland. Um, those out of the, of the amount positive, how many were out of staters versus not? Maybe that's something Dr. Kelso could answer. Yeah, Dr. Kelso. All of the cases to date are Vermont residents. Um, we may or may not actually learn of cases who have, or individuals who have since gone home to their home states who end up being cases. Got it. Um, and we've had a couple weeks of college students back, so no major case spikes, as you, as you noted in the data. Is it too early to declare success in the reopening? Um, and what does this tell us about moving forward? I think the reopening has clearly been a success. As Commissioner Pichek said, the vast majority of students are back on campus at this point. And, um, uh, Virtually all have had their day zero test. Um, most have had their day seven test as well. So we don't expect to see any new big spikes on college campuses due to the reopening. Um, of course, you know, going forward depends on how colleges and students manage the situation when there are cases, um, quickly identifying them, getting them isolated, and getting close contacts into quarantine. If, if that continues to happen, we shouldn't have major problems. And then I have one last one for you. The CDC told states to be ready for a vaccine by November 1st. Vermont, I know, has already been preparing, you know, for the vaccine whenever it's available. But is there concern that this might be too soon, November 1st? And do you think we'll have a viable vaccine by then? It's never too soon to be prepared. And um, we've been working on that in earnest for several weeks. Um, uh, I think we, we are pretty well prepared uh, to begin with because of the robust immunization program we have in Vermont with adult and pediatric healthcare providers getting vaccines at no cost from the health department and distributing them. So we have lots of um, enrolled providers already uh, will be ready when the vaccine is available and it gets shipped by the distributor to Vermont, we'll be ready to get that out. We're working on things now like identifying the key priority populations for uh, what we anticipate will happen is that the, f the first doses we get will be small amounts, small numbers of doses, and we'll have to allocate them to the highest risk groups. Um, and then as we get more and more vaccine, open it up more. Um, and then some of the data and IT issues we're continuing to work on with uh, making sure that providers can access our electronic ordering system uh, to access Vermont's allocation of vaccine. And then as doses are administered to get that data into the CDC reporting system and back into our state immunization registry. So, um, you know, there's lots of work going on. We're pretty well prepared to begin with and we'll be ready when the vaccine is. Thank you. Just, uh, just to go back to the colleges and university for just a minute. Uh, just we can't as a state, uh, we can't as uh, colleges and universities rest on our laurels. It has been successful thus far. 
uh, but we have to remain vigilant. We have to make sure uh, that we're not uh, bringing people in from other states that uh, may be at high-risk counties to come visit uh, students. Uh, that's my biggest concern and that we will um, become lax in some respect and complacent. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we have to keep our eye on and I know the colleges and universities uh, understand that as well and we keep reinforcing that. But that would be a concern in the future. So we don't want to declare victory. We have to remain uh, vigilant. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, you know, we've, we announced this program, just to give those that may not know a little bit of background, we announced this program about two and a half weeks ago, an initiative to stand up regional, what are called child care hubs, as a key component of our initiative to provide expanded school age care on remote uh, learning days. Um, since Tuesday, uh, which is the last day I reported on this, We've had more local partners step forward to help meet the need. Uh, Vermont After School and DCF are reviewing those applications and we are pleased to say that we have more potential hubs and locations in the works. Vermont After School and Let's Grow Kids have, uh, are having community conversations across the state to encourage participation in this new system that is being uh, stood up. We now have 21 identified hub programs, up from 12 that I reported uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. That will run approximately 58 site locations. If you want to sort of visualize this, a hub is a sort of a center and then there's sort of the spokes that go out where the locations are. And so you can have one hub with multiple locations uh, within uh, the childcare setup. These hubs and their locations will be coming online through the next few weeks. At full capacity, the hubs and all the locations that we have, we have identified so far can serve approximately 4,600 children because the sites identified so far are all in school districts that have split schedules for attendance. The first week of school, 17 hubs report that they will be opening 34 locations with 22 more locations coming online in the following week. These 34 locations are expected to serve 1,317 children the first week of school. This number will increase uh, as additional locations come online. We will keep providing uh, child care opportunities, child care slots, uh, but ultimately it's up to uh, the parents to take advantage of those opportunities. We haven't stopped identifying hubs in their locations. Vermont After School and DCF are still working uh, with community partners to find locations throughout the state. For example, uh, there are some places where we know there is an interest, but conversations are ongoing to finalize the actual location in a town. In developing the hub program, uh, careful thought, just, just so we all know, careful thought is being given to establishing a system that helps the immediate child care needs for school aged children on remote learning days without harming the existing network of early childhood after school or youth serving organizations in this state. Remember, hopefully this is a temporary um, uh, infrastructure that we're setting up in record-breaking time. Wherever we can, we'll continue to build upon the investments that the state has made in Vermont's child care system throughout this uh, COVID pandemic. So I hope I gave you enough numbers there to give you the update of where we are. Yeah, just last question for you. How do you plan to keep kids safe from the virus while they're in these hubs? We've had, we've had quite a bit of experience uh, in, uh, in child care uh, with minimal impact in terms of the virus. You re as you re may remember, we never shut down the child care system. We had child care for essential workers during the height of the pandemic, and we kept the infrastructure in place during uh, the height of the uh, pandemic. May not have kids, but we paid 
for the infrastructure to stay in place so that when we opened up the 1st of June, we would have the infrastructure in place. We've had great success since the 1st of June in these, in these sort of uh, uh, either after school or childcare programs. So I, I, I really think we're gonna have continued success as we move forward. Uh, given the health guidelines that we have imposed on these sort of operations and the fact that we have experience in, in doing this. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that we're gonna have the same success moving forward that we've had in the past. Thank you. Uh, Governor, <clears throat> the Vermont NEA uh, gave you uh, the administration a D for preparedness yesterday. Do you have any uh, comment on that? Well, first of all, I think it was a D plus. Uh, we have to keep track of things like that. Um, and I think it was for the schools. Um, I don't know if it was towards me. I, I hope it wasn't just uh, towards me. I know that the, we've had a big, bit of a rocky road with the NEA over the last four years. But this situation, this issue is too important uh, to the kids. And, and I hope uh, that this isn't some sort of uh, targeted approach at me uh, because because we need to work together, uh, and I don't, don't, um, I understand how difficult it is uh, for teachers, uh, administrators, uh, the custodial staff, the support staff, everyone uh, to try and put this together. The kids, the parents, uh, but it's really important. Uh, this uh, we we know. We've heard during these press conferences uh, from some of the pediatricians about how important it is to get the kids back into school because we're, we're losing uh, some of the momentum we were gaining. They're slipping through the cracks and, uh, and it's just too important to get stuck in some of these details. Um, so uh, again, um, we want to hear uh, if there are schools, uh, uh, again, that aren't prepared. We gave them an extra couple of weeks to prepare for this, but if they're still not prepared, uh, we'll continue to work with them uh, to make sure they had everything they need uh, to open up back up on Tuesday. But we haven't heard uh, from a lot of schools individually uh, that uh, that have said, or any uh, from from my standpoint, uh, that um, that need some additional help over the next two or three days. But if they're out there, we want to hear from them. And I might defer to uh, Secretary French to see if uh, if I'm on track with that, or if there's anything that uh, he'd like to add. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I certainly support our guidance. I think it's exceptionally high quality, and um, I'm really proud of the work uh, that our schools have done uh, this summer. It's been a tremendous challenge, and I think likewise, um, you know, our, our team at the agency has done a really good job. But it is it's very challenging work, um, and we literally nonstop are answering questions and reaching out to, and they're reaching out to us, the district. Um, so we stand by to do what's necessary to help them reopen. Uh, but I think for the most part, I think you're on track, Governor, that, um, you know, districts are finding a path forward. I think it was important that we provided them some flexibility for doing that. Um, but I, I, I'm, I expect us to have a very successful initial launch. Uh, I, did, uh, I did stop by the Washington School uh, this week and spoke to the principal there. Uh, they, um, it's not without apprehension, uh, but they're, they're ready to go. Uh, and, uh, and they're looking forward uh, to having the kids back. I think there's about 60 kids that are in the K through four uh, program at the Washington School. So uh, they're actually looking forward to the kids getting back and the teachers are as well. So again, a lot of apprehension, but uh, we'll know a lot more after Tuesday. There, I think uh, Washington School's in for, I think she said four and a half days uh, per week. So we'll see how that works out. Um, I guess is the uh, is the Vermont NEA putting politics ahead of the kids? And, you know, I, I I know they're concerned. I mean, they're representing their members. Uh, but I but I would say uh, that there's a vast amount of, uh, of of members, teachers, that are really doing a tremendous amount of work to make this this happen. And I, I don't want people to uh, if, if there's any animosity towards me in particular, um, we don't want. Our schools to fail. We want our schools to succeed. Um, so I hope everyone can put that aside, put the politics aside. Let's do what's right for our kids. Thanks. All right, moving, moving to the phones. We'll start with Lisa at the Associated Press. 
Hey, um, I wanted to go back to that, the letter from the CDC director to the governor. Um, governor, what do you make of this, this letter uh, about the vaccine preparations coming out, um, asking states to prepare by November 1st, just a couple of days before the election? Yeah, well, again, um, we want to be prepared. We've had this working group uh, for months now, um, trying to make sure that when and if if and when or when uh, the vaccine uh, does come to be when it's safe uh, to distribute, uh, that we're prepared for that. And so we've been working at this again for the last few months. So um, I think this is uh, from the CDC's perspective. It's just uh, just a, a, to tell us, you know, just to make sure uh, that we're ready by that date. I'm, I'm not convinced that, uh, that there'll be a, a vaccine ready by, by then, but we'll learn over the next month or so, uh, whether that's uh, something that is uh, have been tried and tested and, and is safe. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But I, I took the letter uh, as just make sure you're prepared. Uh, if there are any um, permitting or any issues of that nature uh, for some of the facilities that will be warehousing uh, this, uh, this vaccine, make sure you clear the way if you can. And just wanting to make sure that there aren't any, any obstacles uh, to to having the vac vaccines come into your state if and when uh, they're ready to go. And do you think an effective vaccine can be available by then? Well, again, I'm not a, a doctor. I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, I think that's a very aggressive timeline from my perspective, uh, but I know that they're making a, a lot of ground at this point. And again, I hope, I hope they're successful in some respects. Uh, a vaccine is going to give us an opportunity if it's safe uh, and, and proven, uh, it's going to give us an opportunity to get back to normal. Uh, and that's what we all want. We want this to be behind us, not in front of us. So um, if, uh, if they're successful, then uh, I'm, I'm cheering them on. But, uh, but again, it's got to, it has to be, from my standpoint, it has to be safe. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't want this to be a political gimmick. We want this to be uh, a success story. Um, maybe, Dr. Kelso, do you want to? Add anything to that? To Nothing. To okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Um, I hear that there's been some progress with the law enforcement situation in Richford, uh, the, the one that I've talked to you about the last two news conferences. Um, I've heard that they've had much more, um, more patrols, they've gotten some arrests, and they've made contact with a sex offender who was living in very close proximity to the young families at, at the motel that the state positioned those families at. Um, could you give us an update on what's going on in Richford? And I might have one or two follow-ups, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, you probably have uh, better knowledge of that than I do. Uh, some of that is news to me, um, but uh, but I'm happy to hear uh, that there uh, has been progress made. Uh, but, uh, but I know we received a letter uh, from the select board uh, maybe narrowing some of the, their concerns, and, and there were concerns about some of the children uh, there, uh, and uh, and I understand that, and uh, and I believe that the Department of Children and Families is working on that as we speak. I might ask Secretary Smith to to comment on that. And in terms of the law enforcement, uh, I don't know if uh, Commissioner Sherling, if you have anything to offer from a law enforcement perspective, but uh, but again. Uh, this has only been a, a few days in passing, so I'm, I'm just not sure where we're at in that respect. Uh, thank you, Governor. I'll, uh, I imagine uh, Secretary Smith is walking to the podium, so I'll uh, take that quickly and then okay. turn it to him. Um, uh, we did receive some more detailed uh, information and concerns, so uh, the state police followed up. Uh, again, I think uh, the details shared today is a little bit more than, uh, than I uh, has been relayed back to me, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the follow-up has occurred. Um, and I know uh, we've been working with Department of Children and Families to ensure uh, safety in the area, and, and we've also done some call volume assessments to ensure that things are, are on track there. Thank you, Commissioner Sherling. Uh, this is Mike Smith, uh, AHS through the General Assistance Program does house approximately 15 individuals at what is called the Crossing in Richford. We have used the Crossing as one of our motel hotel locations. It, it hasn't been just recent. 
Yeah, we've done that for the last several years. And as always, we encourage those that see something that is concerning to child welfare um, to report that to the D DCF hotline. If you uh, suspect a child is being abused or neglected, please call 1-800-649-5285 to report it. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For matters related to behavior in the community, I think the commissioner uh, just um, addressed some of those. Uh, and DCF will follow up um, on any individuals um, in terms of what we have, uh, what's been reported to us um, by the select board member. Uh, thank you, and uh, if you're done, I think I just have a couple quick follow-ups for the governor. Uh, last night at the meeting, uh, which does happen every Thursday night, uh, several citizens mentioned that uh, maybe the governor should attend so that he could hear some of these concerns in person. Would, governor, would you be willing to attend a socially distanced meeting in Richford on a, on a coming Thursday night? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm always willing to listen. Uh, maybe we could do something remotely in the future, um, but I have a lot of requests. Uh, obviously, we're trying to deal with the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, we're dealing with the legislature at this point in time. Uh, there's a little campaign going on as well, uh, but, uh, but I do my best uh, to listen. Uh, I could send a surrogate or maybe they're doing, hopefully uh, they're doing things uh, by Zoom. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of interaction with community members as well, but maybe there's something we could put together there. But it would, I turned over to my scheduler and, and others. And, and if, if it's not me, uh, obviously uh, we want to have representatives of the administration there to hear the concerns of uh, communities. Okay, and uh, lastly, uh, at last week's meeting, Representative Hangel from Berkshire, uh, who covers uh, Richford in her district, said that the political climate right now in, in Montpelier and, and more specifically in the state, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, is not uh, in a way that would uh, support more manpower with Vermont State Police. Uh, do you share in her view that the political climate wouldn't support more uh, state police law enforcement? And uh, do you agree with that? Well, again, I think even um, pre-pandemic over uh, the last number of years, it's been challenging uh, in terms of uh, trying to uh, have enough of a, of a workforce uh, in terms of law enforcement and so forth. Um, and in terms of some of the local communities, I, I know that they're struggling uh, to try and have their own um, law enforcement uh, as well as some of their contractual relationships with with other with the sheriffs and so forth and I, I think I, I believe I understood uh, that maybe Richford uh, had had uh, not uh, moved forward with uh, with their contract contract with the uh, with the local sheriff uh, which is you know I, I, get, I get that part because it's a fiscal concern uh, but it does put uh, a little bit more pressure on the state police as well. So we are, we're struggling, uh, obviously. I mean, as a, as a, a state and country uh, with, uh, w with some of the political climate uh, that we're seeing. Uh, but I think uh, all in all, I, I don't believe uh, we are uh, any worse off than we were uh, pre-pandemic uh, in terms of uh, law enforcement, but we continue to, to make one of to better ourselves and uh, to provide for the public safety of all Vermonters. I think Greg dropped off the line, so we'll go to the next caller. Aaron, BT Digger. Aaron, BT Digger. Aaron, I think we hear you. All right, Mike Donahue, the Islander. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, I hope to get back to Vermont NEA uh, and their uh, B plus grade or whatever. Uh, there's certainly a bit of irony there that that's the first time 
anybody can recall where a teacher gave uh, a grade anonymously. I mean, usually teachers, uh, everybody knows what the grade is and where it's coming from. Do you believe that Vermont 88 members should actually identify their own school districts, which they are saying are totally unprepared or not fully prepared? I mean, they're, I mean bathrooms don't water or soap, claiming classrooms are without sanitizers, they're claiming the school district has poor maintenance about air conditioning and heating, ventilating. I mean, sh shouldn't these teachers be a little more forthcoming and be working with people? Well, again, you know, I, I'd like to focus on how we get better uh, rather than uh, what, uh, how they utilize the survey. Um, as I, I, I'm not sure that it went to the right people either. Uh, I'm not sure who the experts are, or I would say w when it comes to some of the HVAC, uh, some of the uh, water issues and so forth, uh, probably the maintenance staff would be better able to answer some of those questions and to uh, provide the information to us. But getting back to your initial question, if there is a school uh, that is unprepared uh, and needs some help in some way, uh, we'd like to hear about them uh, so that we can assist um, to give the best experience for the kids. So, yeah, in some respects, uh, if they could tell us uh, what the, which schools are deficient, um, we, we're there to try and do whatever we can to help them. I think that some people that were sort of, there was other questions like, has the administration coordinated with local health officials? I don't know how a teacher would know that necessarily that the superintendent or a principal had talked with health officials and that it just seemed like it was might have been a survey that was thrown together at the last minute or something but yeah again and in, in some of it was based on averages as well i think that there are some schools that are doing very very well and very prepared and maybe others uh, there is some question but, but again, if we, um, if we know about them, um, please let us know. And we'll, uh, we'll do whatever we can to assist them. Okay. As a follow-up to Secretary French, uh, just wondering uh, if you've made any uh, new effort to uh, try to be a little more transparent when it comes to the schools, when they get an outbreak, when they reopen. Uh, I must say we got a lot of negative reactions about the plan to keep monitors in the dark uh, they were people were really shocked at uh, your stance at that uh, in some cases that you wouldn't identify the schools and or whether it was kids or teachers uh, yeah, have, have you reached out to anybody on the transparency side i know you have your usual people that want things kept confidential working for you but have you, have you reached out to any transparency type people in uh, just to, in fairness, I just Secretary French can answer this, but uh, I th believe he was talking about uh, 11 or 12 uh, schools, and that was under 25. I think that was the total um, magnitude of uh, the number of schools that uh, that they would have be hesitant to give out the information. But I'll let Secretary French answer that. But he but he did talk about uh, earlier the the Bennington School that timing and everything like that so okay. again it's another case of you know sometimes we do sometimes the state does start is transparent sometimes they aren't and the total inconsistency like i talked with dr levine the last time about yeah. i think that's what strikes for waters is inconsistency yeah, thanks, Mike. i mean yeah, yeah sir sure. uh, thanks governor um you know, certainly, uh, you know, what I was attempting to do on Tuesday was to sort of foreshadow our latest thinking on that in, in a, an attempt to be fully transparent. I think the issues, uh, especially as I check in with uh, my peers from around the country in, in New England, uh, these issues are the same ones they're working on as well. There needs to be a balance between the two. And as the governor alluded to, I, you know, we're by far and away thinking we're going to we're going to have data for every school. There's only a, a handful of schools that under our current um, thinking that would be excluded from that. Um, but we haven't made any further progress other than, you know, we're working closely with the Department of Health uh, to develop those guidelines. And I think uh, by next week, we'll have them finalized. Is there transparency in that plan anywhere? Yeah, I think our intention would be to, as we do with other uh, data, to fully describe um, our thinking and our parameters around how we're doing the reporting. 
Okay. That would be a Vermont plan. I mean, I know you're talking about other New England states, but things that sometimes fly in Massachusetts may not fly in Vermont and vice versa. So, I mean, I... No, absolutely. I agree. Um, you know, we also have the other side of that, though, is that we have extremely small schools. Um, so I think, you know, we, we definitely uh, have to check in, you know, to your point about reaching out to people. Um, so we do that. We, we have a strong network of, of folks who work in Nashville in that regard. Um, but we do, as we've done with all our guidance, is applied to the very specific circumstances of Vermont. And um, we do still have to strike that, that balance between privacy of uh, the public interest. But we acknowledge that both are equally important. But when schools have a flu and everything like that, it's well known, and the kids are out, so it doesn't take too much to figure out when people have a flu. So it's not going to take too much to figure out people may have COVID either. Yeah, that very well might be the case, but it's a question of whether the state reports the data. Um, so we'll, we'll strike that balance and uh, hopefully have that finalized next week. Great. Thank you all very much. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Jolie, Local 22. That specifically with UVM, they're undergoing the weekly testing. And I'm wondering in K through 12 education, if there's going to be a point or if there's ever been consideration for that age group to undergo any kind of, um, whether it's weekly or biweekly testing. Thanks for that question. I know um, that question has come up a lot lately. I want to explain a little bit about different um, types of tests or reasons to do tests. So there's diagnostic tests when someone is symptomatic. Um, then there's screening testing when people are asymptomatic. And we're doing a, a fair amount of screening testing in Vermont at our health department pop-up sites and um, routinely at correctional facilities and long-term care facilities and other, other congregate sites. The challenge with uh, asymptomatic screening testing is that uh, your likelihood of finding positives is really low and we've seen that in Vermont when we've done facility-wide testing. You know, the vast majority of our results are negative. In order to have a, um, a screening testing program that's really going to give you information that you can act on, you have to set it up so that you're testing people repeatedly on a regular schedule over and over because the prevalence of disease in Vermont is very low. So very few people have it to begin with. And then it, you know, depending on what day you test them, they could be positive or negative. So in order to find people, if you're going to just screen people who are asymptomatic, you need to do it on a regular basis over and over. Um, we don't currently have plans for that. We feel like with the low disease prevalence that we have in Vermont, uh, there's not a need for that, but we'll, we'll reevaluate that if it changes. And you know, we'll continue the efforts that we have ongoing in um, correctional and long-term care and other congregate sites in the meantime. Thank you. Mike, True North Reports. Um, hello, thank you for taking my question. Um, so we've all seen the headlines now about the demonstrations in Burlington and the demands to fire the three police officers who were involved in a uh, controversial use of force incident. And now the police union is saying they can't uh, just fire the three, these three officers despite these demands. We've also all seen around the nation all the headlines out of Portland, Seattle, D.C., Minneapolis, Kenosha, and more of hundreds of businesses getting destroyed, people getting killed, and general chaos. So my question is, what are you doing to ensure that this scenario in Burlington does not turn into uh, looting and rioting and burning down the city? Well, obviously, uh, here in Vermont, we've been fortunate not to have uh, any of the violence that we've seen across the country. You know, I support peaceful protests. Uh, the protest that's happening in uh, Burlington, again, thus far, has been peaceful. 
Uh, so as long as it maintains that peaceful nature, uh, no one will have to intervene. I have, uh, it's our largest city in the state. Uh, they have a very qualified uh, police force. Uh, the mayor is on top of this. Uh, and if there is anything uh, that we can do to assist, obviously we're, we're there to help. But uh, at this point in time, they're, um, they appear to have things well in hand. Um, so if it uh, did um, turn into a situation where, where they needed help, you would be willing to, to get that help, be it the National Guard or, or whatever was available or offered? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I won't get into the specifics of the, what we would do, um, but, um, but we're here to help. I mean, that's part of what the state government, any government is, is there to, uh, to assist uh, for the public safety of its citizens. Uh, this is no different. So if there was a request for help um, from, from the mayor, um, we would obviously engage and do whatever we could to, to assist. But I want to stress, uh, these are, are peaceful protests. Uh, they, uh, they haven't, uh, there hasn't been the violence that we've seen in other states and other, other communities. And um, we uh, hope that continues. And, and if it does, then we won't have a problem. Um, okay, well, well, thank you as always. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go back to Aaron at BT Digger. Yes, uh, the state has relied heavily on the CDC for its guidance in combating the coronavirus pandemic. But recently, there's been a couple instances uh, with the changing of the guidelines and testing, and now with this letter asking states to be ready for a vaccine by November 1st. Is there concern on your part about the CDC losing some credibility as it kind of pertains to turn more into the political sphere? Well, again, um, who's, we, we got, I'm confused now. Who's this on the line? Eric, the time's Eric. up. Oh, Eric, okay, uh, Aaron, if you can hold off, Eric will continue yeah, with his sorry, question. Yeah, sorry, Eric, uh, didn't get confused there for a minute. Um, yeah. Uh, Aaron, I can ask my Aaron. question after Eric, yeah. since you already got it out. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll take your question okay. after Eric then. Uh, All right. Cool. Thank you. Eric, uh, your basic question is about the, the lack of uh, trust in the CDC uh, at this point due to well, politics. Yeah. Do you, do you have any concerns about the credibility of the CDC with this letter that some are saying is political? Two days before the election, they're saying you're ready for a vaccine and rolling back. Uh, a little bit testing guidelines after the president has talked about uh, how we test too much. Yeah, well, I can understand uh, why uh, people are questioning uh, this uh, in particular, uh, but I, I do want to stress there are a lot of good people at the CDC uh, doing things for the right reason. We need uh, to to make sure uh, that they are continuing to provide the best guidance, the best information possible uh, for us uh, in the in the states uh, to follow, and we. We've been watching that, but uh, having said that, uh, again, before they told us to prepare for the vaccine, we've had a working group working for months on this very subject uh, so that we are prepared when and if. So um, from our standpoint, um, we will continue to, to seek guidance from, uh, from the CDC, uh, but, uh, but I feel uh, blessed to have a, a really talented team here in Vermont uh, the you know, Secretary Smith, uh, Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, uh, many uh, pediatricians and health experts at UVM and so forth, and we we you know we have a good team uh, here that we rely on. Um, so if there is anything that comes out of the CDC that's questionable, uh, I know I'm 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 certain uh, that our team uh, will call them out. Uh, but thus far. Uh, again, uh, they, they provide us with uh, a lot of good information, and we should take uh, heed. Uh, and I don't see that the letter, uh, from my perspective, was anything more uh, than be prepared. And we are prepared. We are getting prepared. So um, I think I'd leave it at that. Thank you. All right, we'll try Aaron from VT Digger again. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so um, we have heard from a student at UVM who was kind of first through the grapevine of an outbreak at Redstone campus in, 
in UVM, which, you know, I don't know if you can actually verify that there has, whether or not there's been an outbreak there, but it kind of got us wondering, um, you know, has, has there been any community transfer of the virus at any of the colleges that, you know, we've tried these cases to? And um, also, uh, will students be notified if there is a case in their building, in their floor, in their dorm, in their class, um, or is it more, you know, the general contact tracing rules that have been in place so far? Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Kelso to answer uh, some of that, uh, in particular the contact tracing and so forth. Uh, from my perspective, I, I, and I just want to, if I could, um, did you say that you heard from a student that heard through the grapevine that there may be an outbreak? Is that what I heard? Yeah, uh, yeah. He, he had heard from a friend who heard from an RA that there's an outbreak on Red Stone campus. And yeah. so he knew that there was an outbreak. I don't think we've heard anything officially, and that doesn't sound like an official report from my perspective, but uh, that's how rumors get started. Um, we, uh, we are all obviously in constant contact uh, with the universities uh, throughout Vermont, the colleges and universities, uh, and want them to report, and they have been reporting uh, the number of positive cases, uh, and then we uh, go to work with our team uh, to contact trace uh, to make sure that there isn't, that we do contain it, that it doesn't spread. Um, so if there is a uh, a case or an outbreak of some sort, I would have to believe, I have to have faith uh, in the the institutions uh, to come forward and, and and tell us uh, so that we can uh, contain it, <clears throat> which again would be in their best interests, uh, and I know that they, they would want this uh, so that they don't have a huge outbreak. So again, Dr. Kelso, anything you can add to that? Yeah, first of all, I'll say there is not an outbreak um, at UVM or any of the other colleges. And there, to my knowledge, has been no um, transmission from cases at colleges into communities in Vermont. Um, I think um, the governor's points are spot on. Uh, we need to let the health department contact tracing do its thing. And in the last couple of weeks, um, either 97 or 99 percent of all of our cases, um, within 24 hours of them being reported to the health department, the contact tracers have reached those people, interviewed them, gotten to work on the important work of making sure they're isolated, identifying their close contacts, getting them into quarantine. That's how we stop disease spread. It's not through, you know, rumors or. Um, the buzz in the community. So um, the contact tracing team is on top of every situation really, really quickly. And um, we're also on top, you know, we hear those same types of rumors or um, questions about is there an outbreak at, at a certain establishment. And, um, you know, just because there's a case who maybe ate at a restaurant or worked in a business, uh, doesn't necessarily mean they were even there while they were infectious. And that's the work that the contact tracing team does. They find out when the symptoms started or when the test was done. They figure out, therefore, when the person was infectious and at risk to other people, and then who they were around while they were infectious. But just because somebody who has confirmed COVID um, was somewhere doesn't mean that those people were exposed. So reach out to the health department if you have questions. If you don't hear from the health department, it means you were not identified as a close contact, even if there is a case in your dorm or work site or school or other setting. And Erin, I just wanna make sure you saw Commissioner Pichek's uh, data presentation, which showed 33 cases total out of all the, what was it, 17, 27,000 tests of college students. That's in the today's deck. Yes, yeah. yes, I, I did see that. Um, I guess, you know, there's just a lot of fear from students that they're thinking, oh, uh, someone could, in my dorm, could have COVID and I could not know it. Um, that's kind of the fear that I'm, I'm hearing from students, uh, even though, you know, I've heard from you guys many assurances that 
you know, if someone has significant contact, they will be notified. Yes, I mean, the, the contact tracers will be in touch with anyone uh, that the, uh, the person may have come in contact with. Uh, we want to hear uh, from them. Again, it's in all of our best interests to, to identify this uh, and be transparent uh, so that we can contain it, uh, so that we don't have this outbreak. We want to continue to open up the economy. We want to continue to have more in-person instruction for our schools. Uh, again, it, it takes all of us uh, to make that happen. So sometimes, you know, the fear is we have to acknowledge uh, that there's a lot of fear, a lot of apprehension out there. Um, but sometimes the fear is worse than the virus itself. So we have to get a handle on that too. And we have to, again, as a government, uh, provide for that faith and trust so that they, they you know, it will lessen the fear. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, hi, Governor. I've been on the UVM campus several times in the last week or so. I didn't see a single person without a mask on, a student or a staff member, and I didn't sense any fear uh, on campus at all. It, it seemed almost uh, normal, but a uh, fewer students, I would say, uh, than usual. So I'm not sure. The, the, only, the only other side to that is that people get complacent, and that's what we want to, you know, there's got to be a certain uh, amount of respect uh, for the virus without the fear uh, so that we continue to do the right things. But I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, that there is uh, such a uh, prevalence of, of mask wearing uh, across the campus. Yeah, I didn't see any uh, anyone not masked. Just Great. Uh, hundreds of students and staff. Uh, the, the question I had is over the, 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 the CARES Act money that's still left over here in Vermont, it's pretty substantial. It doesn't look like Washington is going to do anything soon and that money is going to expire at the end of the year. It, I know you're, you're working with the legislature, but is, is the time come to redistribute that money, perhaps uh, increase the, the money to businesses and uh, employers? Yeah, well, as you know, uh, we put a, a plan forward to the legislature that did utilize all the, all the CARES money. Uh, so we have a plan in place. Uh, just in case uh, that there isn't any more flexibility given to the states uh, that would put the, hand, the money in the hands of needy Vermonters as well as to the businesses that are the economic driver uh, of revenue uh, for the state and putting people back to work. So uh, we have a plan uh, that we put forward. We think it's solid. And, um, and if, if uh, Congress doesn't take action to give us more flexibility, we can, we can use that money. But, but again, it's going to take, you know, we're going to have to, to, to do it uh, at least a couple of months before the end of the year if Congress isn't going to act because uh, uh, we don't want to send any money back to, to, uh, to Washington. We, could, we sure could use it here and put it to good use. Well, I just think that there seems to be more of a sense of urgency now to, to act. And I'm just wondering what, the, what your interaction with the legislature has been on that. Um, you know, it's, it's still... Uh, we're only uh, about a week and a half in uh, at, in terms of the legislature. Um, so um, we're hoping uh, that they will pay attention. I think they are. Uh, and uh, working on the budget and so forth and what we can uh, do to get some of this money out the door. The sooner we can get it out the door, uh, the better off we're all going to be. All right, great. Thanks, Governor. Peter Hirschfeld, BPR. Yeah, first, just a, a quick clarification on the 27,000 tests of college students that have yielded 33 confirmed positive cases. Um, did I hear Patsy Kelso correctly when she said that that uh, total number of positive does not include students who are from out of state, came to Vermont, tested positive here, and then went back to the state that they originated from? Uh, I will ask Commissioner Pichek or Dr. Kelso, but I believe it didn't include the students that maybe had the test before they came um, into the state. I, and she's shaking her head, yes. It's, it's for those students that, uh, that had the test done before they came to the state uh, and, or didn't come to the state at that point. It doesn't include those students that were tested. Understood, for those thank students. you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Pichek, I noticed in the uh, slide deck 
the, there's the side-by-side -side modeling of uh, average daily cases without school opening and average daily cases with school opening. Under both of those scenarios, it looks like uh, you're forecasting um, an almost doubling of the average daily case count in the state over the next month. Um, and I understand that that's not a huge uh, increase in terms of raw numbers, but I'm hoping you can explain why you're anticipating that increase uh, in September. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Pete. Um, so first, you know, just think about those 33 students that just were tested from higher ed. You know, that's basically on top of our normal case count that we might have had in any given week. So that gets factored into the forecast, basically, you know, what's your recent, um, what's the recent number of, t of positives that you've had. So that's part of what explains the uptick generally. And then when you layer on K through 12 on top of that, you see that, um, you know, there is again, what I'd consider a slight uh, uptick beyond that, but uh, really that increased mobility from the K through 12, uh, from students going back to school, the parents being more mobile, uh, was pretty pretty mild. And just to give you a perspective, the forecast for, for New Hampshire and Maine, you know, they're forecasting, you know, 30 to 40 cases a, a day through September. So our numbers continue to look uh, pretty good relative to Vermont and relative to the Northeast as well. Um, and then I'm going to squeeze one more in here. I apologize. Governor, um, as it relates to the NEA report card that they gave you, one of the one of the biggest criticisms is that you didn't use your authority to create a more consistent reopening plan across district lines. Um, can you talk about why you chose not to um, maybe have a, a stronger hand in telling districts how many days they were going to have to be open, um, as opposed to just leaving it them, leaving it to them to decide. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for that question. Um, as uh, as you might remember, it was my wish uh, and those of those uh, pediatricians and health experts uh, that came to this press conference and advocated for more in-person instruction. I, I still am a proponent of more in-person instruction. Uh, but there was a, a lot of pushback uh, from um, from members, NEA in particular. Um, so we acknowledged that and uh, tried to give as much flexibility as possible, um, not knowing exactly. Uh, you know, I, again, I I tend to, uh, to try and give uh, flexibility so that we can prove ourselves and and build the faith and trust that's needed uh, in the programs as they exist. With so many different schools doing different, uh, taking different approaches, I think we can learn from one another. We learned that from here in the United States uh, when we saw states uh, reopening uh, quicker than I wanted to open, for instance. Uh, and, uh, and, and I said then, I don't know if we're right or wrong, uh, but we'll learn from them. And, uh, and again, when I look at Georgia or Arizona or, or Texas and Florida and so forth, I think we made the right decision uh, and we learned from them. I think we'll see the same thing here. Uh, my hope is that we'll have a very safe opening, uh, that they will, there will be less apprehension uh, two weeks from now than there is today, and uh, this will be successful and that uh, they will be able to transition to more uh, in-person instruction, which is, as we've seen, uh, the, the da data tells us, uh, the, the experts tell us, that's the right approach. Uh, but again, uh, don't, we can't push too hard uh, because uh, we don't want to uh, uh, have this uh, trepidation continue, and we don't want it to be a political fight. Uh, it's really about what's best for the kids. Thank you very much. Ann Wallace Allen, BT Digger. Hi, can you hear me? We can. So um, we know that the hospitality, the leisure and hospitality industry has been hit the hardest of all the sectors as a result of the pandemic closures. Um, and the business owners have had a pretty tough summer because of the quarantine and the capacity limits, but mainly because of people not coming up at all. And I'm wondering, are you thinking of easing up the quarantine restrictions at all this autumn? And on a related note, you know, with the weather getting colder, it's gonna be more difficult for people to eat outside. And I'm wondering if you guys have any plans to increase the capacity limits for indoor dining in restaurants. Yeah, um, we talked about this a little bit, uh, I think, last week. And uh, my, my view is that we need to get through this school reopening, uh, both from the college and universities perspective, uh, as well as the K through 12. 
and do so successfully. And if we get through this successfully over the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, then my focus will then be, uh, because that's a priority, our kids are the, are the priority from my perspective right now. And then uh, two weeks from now, if it's successful uh, and we don't have any uh, major, major outbreaks, um, then we'll focus on the, back on the economy. And I believe uh, that uh, we're going to have to give some, some uh, aid, uh, some assistance uh, to those restaurants and lodging facilities uh, so that they can uh, hopefully make it through uh, this upcoming uh, winter season. So it is going to be difficult. They've had, uh, uh, they've had a, 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 a lot of um, um, headwind uh, over the last few months, obviously the hardest hit sector of the economy. Uh, so uh, we want to give them some relief and uh, we have some plans to do so. But again, the priority is uh, school reopenings at this point. But in a couple of weeks, if we're successful, uh, then we'll uh, we'll give some hopefully give some relief to those uh, in the hospitality sector. Do you mean um, relief in the form of easing up restrictions or relief That's in the form what, of grants? Yeah, no, I'm hoping for both. Actually, uh, they need uh, more dollars. Uh, we've uh, we've put um, forward plans to do just that uh, with the legislature, uh, but also in in terms of restrictions. Thanks so much. Guy Page. Hi, Governor. The Agency of Natural Resources announced it will enforce the three acre runoff rule that puts all landowners with three or more acres of impervious surfaces like roofs, driveways, and parking lots, puts them on the hook to, uh, for a very expensive runoff plan. At the same time, your administration uh, supports changes in Act 250 that some critics say could actually make municipal sewer and stormwater overflow worse. Uh, do, do you see the conflict there, and is there anything that you want to do about it? And what, are the, what is the opportunity of getting federal funding to, to really overhaul our municipal sewer system? Yeah, there's no doubt um, that uh, what we've seen with climate change uh, and the amount of rainfall and the uh, the uh, uh, the amount of, uh, of these storms, the, the catastrophic nature of these storms has, has led to overwhelming some of the uh, sewer uh, systems in our state. Um, so uh, we want to uh, continue to do whatever we can uh, to provide for um, relief in that respect. I believe the federal government will give us a sum in the future, um, but, um, but the three acre um, um, parcel uh, plan that we put together uh, is going to be uh, difficult uh, for those in business. Uh, we acknowledge that we have, um, we're going to be utilizing some of the money uh, that we have uh, for uh, the uh, lakes and streams uh, to, to try and assist in doing that. But it was uh, necessary. This was a plan that was put together uh, before uh, I took office, but, um, but we had to fulfill that uh, in order to satisfy the EPA. So uh, in doing so, uh, we can move forward. Um, but, uh, but I don't see the conflict uh, between the changes in Act 250 uh, to what we're doing here. I might ask uh, Secretary Moore, uh, she's on the line, if she might be able to clear that up a little bit further. Sure, I would be happy to, Governor. Um, you are exactly right that the, the, there isn't really a, an inherent conflict between the, the three acre permit and the um, concerns that many have raised regarding sewer overflows. Both of those are, are complex and important projects and we have programs in place to work to address both of them. Um, the combined sewer overflows and some of the concerns that have been raised regarding the, the potential for increasing sewer overflows as a result of, of increases in development in our downtown designated centers are being addressed through um, the development and implementation by those municipalities of, of long-term control plans that will eventually see the combined sewer overflows eliminated. And the three acre permit gets at one of the important sources of phosphorus pollution that we know is having an impact on Lake Champlain. Runoff from developed lands um, contributes up to 20% of the phosphorus reaching the lake and this three acre permit is an important step um, in reducing that contribution and achieving our overall water quality goals. Can you tell us a little bit more about those long term control programs to control the uh, sewer runoff? Sure. Uh, 
they are facility and community specific plans that look at ways to first um, try to develop stormwater management practices and in some, some areas these three acre projects may actually be in service of the goal of reducing combined sewer overflows, um, keeping stormwater out of those single pipe systems. Um, and then the next step, which is it can be more um, expensive, complicated, but also has the, um, the unfortunate or unintended consequence of, of removing stormwater from the combined sewer system through separate pipes means that at times those stormwater discharges no longer receive treatment. Um, these are, are, are long projects with, with extended timelines um, in large part because this requires separating literally um, miles of sewer that go under other pieces of important infrastructure, whether it's streets or buildings or homes. Um, and so that, that it, it takes time and it's complicated and expensive, but each of the communities um, with a combined sewer system at this point has entered into an order with the agency um, that prescribes a path forward with clear milestones. Okay, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Governor, a question about your uh, executive order on policing. Can you tell us when that's going to be and a little bit, few more details on what it will be? We, we saw the report coming out from the state police about the co-directors for fair and impartial policing. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, the executive order is online uh, at this point. We haven't issued oh, a press release, good. but it's been on online for a couple of weeks. The press release should yeah. go out today. Yeah, we should have the press release out today. Well, I'll, I'll look online. Thank All you. All right, thank you. Yeah. Mara, Barton Chronicle. Mara Brooks, Barton Chronicle, star six to unmute. All right, we'll go to Steve, NEK TV. Um, hello, can you hear me? We can. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, Governor, uh, what's the, uh, the amount of people uh, uh, did, it is illegal to for, for a large gathering? Um, I believe, I may have to, uh, to ask Secretary Curl a bit. I believe it's 150 outside, 75 inside, but I'm not positive of that. So the, the yeah, Secretary Curley. Oh, it is Secretary Curley. Yeah, you got that right. I will say uh, Burlington, I believe, uh, made a change to that. So I right. think their gathering size is 25, but um, you could double check me on that. As well. Yeah, we, we did uh, allow for flexibility with the municipalities to, to make that stricter, and Burlington was one community that did take advantage of that. So they have stricter limits. I, I believe it's maybe 25 outside, 10 inside, or something of that nature. So the large, the large gathering or the, the party that they had at Killington was uh, perfectly legal? Yes, yeah. And we, uh, we actually uh, confirmed that. I mean, we, um, we talked uh, about how the, the owner uh, did all the right things uh, and uh, the staff did. And uh, from there, it was just about trying to contact Trace and we weren't getting as much cooperation as we had hoped uh, in the beginning, but uh, it all turned out uh, for the best and we uh, we were able to get a hold of everyone it was a private okay, function right. though. sure sure I understand um, and regarding the uh, your your uh, D plus grade from the NEA um, considering uh, Vermont's per pupil cost uh, the school outcomes and the dropout rate uh, wouldn't you consider this like a badge of honor <laughs> Well, I, no, I think any, I don't know. Um, uh, and I don't, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't want to characterize uh, the D plus uh, as them uh, pointing directly at me, uh, unless I have this wrong. I think the D plus uh, they said was in preparedness for schools in their, uh, from their perspective, from the teachers or the union representatives' perspective. Uh, that they, some schools weren't ready uh, and gave a failing grade. Others uh, were doing uh, very well and then they averaged it all together and came up with the D plus. 
Um, but, um, but again, um, we need to move on from this. Um, we're going to open up schools on Tuesday. And I think it's going sure. to take all of us uh, to make sure that's successful. And I would hope uh, that we could put everything aside in order to give the best experience possible for our kids and keep them safe uh, under these circumstances. So we're in the, in the midst of a once in a century pandemic. Uh, these are unusual times. There is no playbook for this. But what we do know, as I've said before, from the experts, pediatricians, health experts, Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, and others uh, who've been on this, uh, uh, in these press conferences, what's best for the kids is to get them back into the schools, back in in-person instruction. That's what's best. So if we can all uh, do our part, work together, and, uh, and, and make this happen successfully, our kids are going to be better off. So we can, uh, sure. we can save the uh, political battles uh, for uh, January uh, if I'm successful in November. Sure. Uh, a quick question about phosphorus. Uh, I, I, I keep hearing about uh, phosphorus loads coming from uh, yeah, paved and unpaved surfaces. Uh, I don't quite understand how this mechanism works. I know I've seen, you know, I've seen them spread salt uh, uh, in the winter on uh, unpaved and paved surfaces, but uh, where does the phosphorus actually come from on paved and unpaved surfaces, if I may? Yeah, I, I, th I can I'll refer to Secretary Moore on this, but because they're impervious, obviously, uh, there's no uh, capacity for those, uh, those areas uh, to have the, the phosphorus soak in and, uh, and then naturally uh, try and, and, uh, and filter that. So that's where the problem is. Um, but uh, in terms of where it comes from, uh, I'll uh, refer to Secretary Moore. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, the, the sources of phosphorus are um, variable, but probably one of the more significant ones is organic debris that lands on the road surfaces. Um, there are studies that have been done in a number of, of communities um, across the, the Midwest and Northeast that show that particularly in fall during leaf season, uh, the accumulation of leaf matter on our roads is a really significant source of phosphorus and stormwater. Um, the, and the same might, might be said for, for dirt roads and, and vegetated that decaying and dying vegetation matter that uh, accumulates in, in roadside ditches. Um, there's a very trace amount of phosphorus in, in rainwater itself, um, but or its contact with organic matter, and as the governor indicated, its inability to, to soak away um, are really the, the reasons that, that stormwater is, is a significant contributor of phosphorus. Okay, and don't, uh, doesn't this leaf debris uh, in, in cityscapes and particularly urban areas, um, and don't the leaves also uh, uh, have a saturation with uh, PAHs, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons? They, they, they certainly, they certainly can. Um, and, and one of the, the best management practices that we've been evaluating um, is, is frequent leaf removal and street sweeping um, and the impact that that can have, beneficial impacts that that can have, not only on phosphorus, but other pollutants of concern. Sure, because I, I, I knew they wouldn't take them at a composting facility a few years ago because of the, the hydrocarbons. All right. Well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Steve. Olivia, WCAX. Good afternoon. So a while back, um, there had been discussion about teacher shortages. So I was wondering if you're seeing those now. I mean, school starts in three days. Are schools prepared with teachers, fully staffed? Uh, again, I'll uh, refer to Secretary French, but I, I just want to remind everyone when we're talking about shortages of any sort in terms of labor, teachers, and, and other areas, uh, remember uh, where we were like a year ago uh, where we had uh, the lowest unemployment rate in, in the country. Uh, we were really suffering from we had more jobs and we had uh, unemployed people to fill them. Uh, and that was problematic in this state. The number of, I look back uh, a year, over the last few years, uh, the, the need for more bus drivers, uh, for instance, 
uh, that was here before uh, this pandemic. So uh, this is uh, uh, further escalated, I believe, in some respects. Uh, it's going to be challenging for us. It was challenging for us before, and I'm sure it's going to be challenging for us now. Uh, but Secretary French, can you add anything to that? Yes, thank you, Governor. Uh, no, we haven't heard uh, reports of widespread shortages at this point. Um, I know districts are, uh, to the governor's point, um, actively uh, beefing up their substitute teacher rosters. Um, so I know folks are interested in substitute teaching. Your local district will be interested in adding you to the roster. Uh, but so far, uh, have not, uh, not been aware of, of shortages in terms of uh, reopening schools. Okay, and then I also have another question for you, Secretary French. Um, so I've been looking at, at hybrid models, and on remote days, some students um, or some schools require students to join classes virtually through a live stream. Other schools will assign work and expect students to complete it on their own. Is this worrisome that some students will not receive formal instruction on their remote days? Like, will some students fall behind because they're not? as much instruction as some of their peers at another school? Uh, no, I don't think it's worse than per se. I think, you know, the, the idea of hybrid instruction implies a lot of different things. And certainly I think what you're pointing to is sort of the differences between what we call synchronous versus asynchronous instruction. And I think there's districts are provisioning both. Both uh, can be successful. Of course, to your point about, you know, how do we know they were successful? We, we have to work at um, how are we going to assess the impact of that instruction, what we call formative assessment. And that's still a very critical uh, uh, approach, regardless of uh, the methodology. So I think uh, this, this will be the important work um, going forward as schools are reopened, um, as we begin to assess the impact of, uh, of the emergency on student learning. Um, but I think, you know, all these different methodologies um, are useful to a certain extent, but they need to be evaluated uh, based on looking at the impact on student learning. Thank you very much. And again, Olivia, uh, it is our intent um, to try and prove ourselves and to have a successful opening so that we can get back to uh, normalized uh, in-person instruction, which we know is best for our kids. Thank you both. Colin, seven days. Hi, Governor. I'd like to ask you about yesterday's report in The Atlantic regarding comments President Trump has made about the armed forces. Um, according to the magazine reporting, which I should be clear, the White House has denied, the President made disparaging comments about certain World War II Marines who died in battle, calling them suckers and losers. And the account ended with other disparaging comments about modern veterans who were wounded in war. Um, I know your father was severely wounded during D-Day. I just wanted to ask you, what do you make of the President's alleged comments? Um, and have you given any further thought to whether you uh, will be voting for um, Vice President Biden? Yeah, uh, a couple of things. <clears throat> as, uh, as you might have uh, acknowledged, I have a great deal of respect for anyone who serves uh, uh, in the military, uh, specifically those uh, from the greatest generation, World War II. I, I take a great exception uh, to anyone disparaging them in any respect anyone who serves in the military uh, should uh, get our appreciation uh, and uh, be thanked uh, every single day uh, for that. And I've said that uh, over the last four years. Uh, you get a chance, you see a veteran, thank them. Thank them for their service and the sacrifices they made for all of us uh, so that we could stand here today and, uh, and do the things uh, that we enjoy as well as uh, have uh, some of uh, our, our free um, independence uh, and liberties uh, that uh, we sometimes um, take for granted. So again, I take great exception to that. I have not read the Atlantic article, but I did uh, see the headlines and I intend to read it over the weekends. But um, it's just, if true, um, I remember um, some of the things that uh, the president has said about uh, one of my uh, favorite politicians, John McCain. Uh, who was a POW um, and, uh, and came back again after that experience to s serve his country in a much different way, a maverick, um, and, and said uh, what was on his mind. And I really appreciated everything that he did uh, for us and in, in, in our country. And I remember some of the statements he made about him in particular 
and I take great offense to that. So uh, in terms of whether I've said before uh, I won't be voting uh, for President Trump, uh, I haven't decided as to whether um, um, Vice President, former Vice President Biden uh, will, will get my vote, but, um, but I would not rule that out. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Well, thank you very much for tuning in again. We'll see you on Tuesday. And again, have a, a very safe, hopefully uneventful uh, um, Labor Day um, observ observance. And, uh, and make sure you mask up and stay away from uh, large gatherings uh, so that we can have a successful opening of the schools on Tuesday. Thanks again.